So even though that Brooks Robinson played for the Orioles a couple decades before I was born, my father would often tell me about him as I was a young baseball player myself. One of the things that he pointed out to me, <coughs> other than Brooks being the best defensive third baseman ever to play the game, was how he prepared and how he practiced. That there are many different skills that are needed to be an amazing third baseman in baseball. Your footwork, your throwing, your fielding, short hops or the in-betweeners, how to break for a pop-up or how to apply a tag, when to jump and how to charge and throw a slow roller or bunt to first base. Yes, there were many different skills needed to be a third baseman. And if he would let just a couple of those skills begin to lag behind, he would, and his play would begin to suffer in more and more ways. And he would not be the best that he could be, and he would probably no longer even be able to play in the league in which he was the best at. Like a bucket with a hole or with different slats, you can only be filled as high as where that first hole is or the crack is, or wherever it is that we begin to see our weakest link. So Brooks would not only practice his all-around game, but he would spend extra time focusing on what he and his coaches believed was the weakest link in his abilities. If it was charging the ball, or fielding a ground ball, or whatever it might be, he would spend extra time working on that skill until it was no longer the weakest part of his game. And then we move on to the next, and so on and so forth. Yes, over these next seven weeks, we're going to look into seven faith practices. Prayer, the study of scripture together and individually, worshiping God as a community, encouraging or teaching the faith to others, serving as Jesus served, giving generously, and finally, invitation and evangelism. Each one of these seven faith practices are all ways in which we grow stronger in our faith. These are tools. These are opportunities that God has graciously given us to grow closer to God, to each other, and to our neighbor. Our three R's, right? Relationship, relationship, relationship. Relationship with God, with the community of faith, and with our community and our neighbors and the world around us. Yes, God has given us these opportunities, these tools, in order to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be made holy, to be made representatives of Jesus Christ, to be his disciples in this world. These are gifts from God for us to experience who God is, what God's mission is, and what purpose we may have as part of that mission. Not only individually, but as a community of faith together. Each one of these tools from God, each one of these gifts, is a way for us to experience God more. And today we are going to begin by focusing on the faith practice of prayer. My guess is that we hear about prayer all the time. We pray together in worship. We pray before meetings. We pray at Bible studies. We pray at dinner. We pray a number of different places and at different times. But I also hear, when I ask people about prayer or about their prayer life, a number of other comments as well. Well, I pray sometimes. I really don't know how to pray. I can't pray correctly, and so I don't even try. Or just, I forget to pray. Many of us may feel that we can connect with one of those reasons that our prayer life begins to struggle. We have been given or expectations that have been created for us that we think that we have to somehow say the perfect prayer 
or do it the right way, or else God's not going to hear us, or else it's not going to count. How many of us growing up that the only person ever allowed to pray in church was the pastor? Right? That was the only real prayer. Can't start eating your donuts or having a luncheon before the pastor comes over because if anybody else prayed, it wouldn't quite count enough. He's got to earn his salary. That's what we pay you for, pastor. That's your job. You handle the God stuff. We'll eat the food. Right? Or maybe it was always our mother or father or grandparents, somebody in the family that always said the best prayers at the family gatherings. And they were filled with wonderful, long, and big words that described God and all the beauty of the world around us. They gave the best weather report. Thank you, God, for this bright, sunny, 75 degree day. Winds two to four miles from the east, yes. And that can be intimidating. That can make us feel that that's the only way to pray. I'm not blaming people. It's part of the reality in which many of us were raised in. We're afraid that we might mess up when we pray. We might forget where we are or what we're saying. We don't want to pray in front of other people because it might not be nice enough. Or it's just not a priority for some of us. It's something we've allowed to lag behind. A skill we've not really worked on and discovered our abilities in ourselves. We can fall out of the habit of praying. Especially when we begin to doubt our own ability. Or whether or not God's going to listen to me. As opposed to someone else. So there are different ways that we can kind of learn to pray, different forms, like we talked with the kids, just a real basic address God, thank God, ask for something, and then in Jesus' name. I mean, there's basic things that can be tools to help us learn how to pray. But I invite us now to dive into our three scripture readings that we heard this morning that reference prayer and the way that prayer works in many different ways. I said that I canceled faith formation because of the impending cold. The reality is because I have a 45-minute sermon. You ready, Phyllis? All right. <laughs> right, I mean, we can only touch on the tiny little bit of what prayer is and what prayer means in this time we have together. But we're going to fly through some of these things, lifting up different themes and reasons and ways that God works through prayer, hears our prayer, and invites us into prayer. We see in our first reading that we are to pray without ceasing. Pray always. Pray about everything. Because it helps us know the will of God. How many of us only turn to God in prayer when we want something? How many of us would have anything left in our life if all we asked for, all we had today was what we gave thanks for last night? What would be left in our life if all we had was what we thanked God for last night? We'll often say, well, it's up to God now because I've tried everything else. Got to leave it to God instead of turning to God first in prayer. So yes, this passage reminds us that we pray without ceasing. We pray about every single thing in our life. And all that does is help us to know God better and to know each other better as well. We pray in thanksgiving to help us to focus on the many great blessings in our lives that we can look at the 99 amazing things instead of that one thing that just keeps bugging us, that eats away at us causing us to ignore the 99 good. We pray without ceasing because everything we have and everything we are, including ourselves, our children said it up front, we are alive as a gift of God. We pray out of ceasing and thanksgiving because despite our sinfulness, God will listen to each and every single one of us 
We don't need a special go-between person. We don't have to turn to the priest or the pastor. But we know that because of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, God hears each and every one of us in our prayers. We pray without ceasing in thanksgiving because even with all this world has to give us, the pains and the hurts, we know that we have been given the gift of our salvation. Not by anything we have done, but purely because of what Christ has done for us, giving his life to defeat the power of sin and being raised from the dead three days later, giving us this gift of new life, growth, grace, and salvation. That's just a little bit. And then Paul moves on to other reasons that we pray. We pray to test everything. What is the best decision to make? What does God want me or want us to do? Should I listen to that person? Or should I go another direction? Yes, Paul tells us in his letter to pay attention and to pray about every single decision, especially about those who are preaching and speaking on God's behalf. To test what they say, to see the fruits of their work, to understand God's call in that time and place. So Paul tells us that we pray, and through prayer we receive strength. That we are able to hold fast to things that are good and help us to abstain from the things that go against God, that are evil in God's eyes. Yes, when we have someone who is baptized or they're confirming their faith, we say, do you renounce the devil and all the things that defy God and all things that draw us from God? And yes, we say we do with God's help. And one way that God helps us through the Holy Spirit is through our prayer, that we can turn to God in our doubts and our temptations and offer them to, in prayer to God, asking God for the Holy Spirit to give us the strength and the guidance that we need. To put us in community together. That when I'm doubting, someone else can help carry me in my faith during their time and their praise of God. It's why the Apostle Paul shows us these examples of how prayer can help us grow in our faith in our actions, in our work, and in our knowledge of God and God's will, and to help us fight temptation and to focus on being disciples of Christ. That is a quick overview of that first reading. There is so much more that we could dive into just in those few verses of the power of prayer. And then we hear from Matthew, who comes at it in a different way when Jesus turns the screws on us a little bit. Oh, it's easy to pray for the people that are nice to you. It's easy to pray for the people who love you. Even the wicked people can do that. But pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for the people you don't like. Why? Because it forces us to recognize that they are people too. When it's so easy to dehumanize people and discredit people because of who they are or what they say or what they believe or what they've done to me and write them off as terrible, terrible people that I never have to care about again, our prayer for them forces us to recognize that they are also children of God. That they are loved as much as we are loved. And it's hard for us to hate those that we pray for. Now, how do we pray for them? Jesus isn't saying, oh, I pray for Phyllis that she finally figures it out and stops being such a wicked person. That's true, I wouldn't pray for that because that's a lost cause. But for other people... <laughs> She drinks black coffee. Anyway, for other times, right, we pray not to make that person nice to me, not to make that person believe what I believe, not to make it a selfish prayer. We pray for their well-being. We pray for that person to be loved and to know God's wisdom and to be filled with the Holy Spirit just as we ask that for ourselves. 
Paul says we pray and we feed and we clothe and we give drink to our enemies, like heaping coals of fire on their head. They are still children of God. They are still loved by God. So we have to see Christ even in those people. It doesn't mean that we just blatantly let them hurt us or take advantage of us, but we don't hate them. We don't dehumanize them as somehow lesser or less than me. Yes, it's easy to pray for those who love us, but praying for those who hurt us or our enemies or the people we just don't like, that takes a strong faith. The other thing that happens when we pray for those people is we begin to maybe notice the log in our own eye instead of just the speck in theirs. We have to admit ourselves that we too have made mistakes, that we too fall short, that we're not the perfect thing that they have to be. But we recognize that we too need God's grace and forgiveness to help us to understand the ways in which we can respond to be faithfully to God, faithful to God as well. It helps us to learn and appreciate maybe things about people who are just different from us, things that we don't understand or we don't really like that much, things that help us to say and see how God might be active in their life, how they experience God through their own Context, their own culture, and how the beauty of this diversity is something that we praise and we give thanks for. That God is not just the God of one person, but of the entire creation. So praying for our neighbor forces us past our own wants, past our own desires, and causes us to see them as equal children in the eyes of God. It causes us to see for the people we don't understand or we're not quite sure about the beauty then maybe of the diversity of this world around us. And that we recognize that Jesus died for them the same as Jesus died for me. Yes, Jesus turns the screw. It's not easy. It takes work. But God will work through us and in us and around us. Give us that strength in prayer. Yes, both Jesus and Paul's writing deals with the community as well, all the reasons above, as well as the need for all of us to discern together, to ask God together, for strength together, for forgiveness together, for openness together to those who are different from us, for prayers that keep us focused on what it means to be a community of faith. Prayer that helps us to grow in our understanding of who God is and what God is doing together as the community of faith. Now with our collective relationships, our collective skills, our collective gifts and abilities and resources that we can be this community of faith stronger together than we could ever be on our own. And then we get into a little bit about how do we pray? Yes, Jesus' disciples in Luke say to Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. How do we do it? How do we do it right? John, John taught his disciples, so give us a hint, a clue, a way, a form to pray to God. So Jesus gives the disciples a form of prayer as well as one they can use and a prayer that we continue to use today. A couple thousand years later, as God's people in this time and in this place. First, praise and thanksgiving to God, our Father in heaven, hallowed, sacred, special is your name. We praise you for being our great divine parent in heaven whose name is above all other names. We pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done, not just so that it's here, But Luther reminds us that when we pray this prayer, we ask God that we can be a part of it. We pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done so that we can be part of God's mission in this world. We ask for our daily bread. 
And again, Luther in his small catechism helps us to learn that this is more than just a piece of bread every day. This is everything that we need to be alive. Our kids in our prayer help to name many of those things. Shelter, clothing, food, water, all these things that God knows that we need. And again, that we can be a part of, that we need for ourselves, but that we can then help to share, as the kids told us. We thank God for the ability to share like Jesus, that we can share these blessings then with those who don't have the same resources that some do. And then we ask God to forgive our sins, or debts, or trespasses. Depends on which version you like to read. Forgive us our sins, God, because we have fallen short. Make us clean. Make us right with you. And help us, God, to do the same with others. We forgive as we have been forgiven. We love as we have been loved. We bless others as we have been blessed. And finally, we ask God to care for us as we go forward, not into temptation, to keep us from dangers and perils and the sins of this world. Yes, in our worship service, we pray this prayer every single week, recognizing Holy Communion as an opportunity for us to receive the power and strength and forgiveness, the promises of our daily bread, but also as a reminder of our relationship with God, with each other, and with all people who have communed in the whole church from every time and every place. Yes, these examples of prayer show us how prayer is about relationship. Most importantly, our relationship with God and how our relationship with God then strengthens and empowers us in our relationship with each other and with the world around us. Through these things, we receive power, strength, discernment, forgiveness, stronger relationships, healing, and wisdom. All these things come by the will of God. We may not always understand the answers. We may not always like God's answer. And sometimes the worst answer is that we have to wait. That God's timing is not always ours. We have to be careful, as we say, because when we pray for something, God might expect us to be part of that answer. That when we pray for those without food, that God might expect us to start sharing our food with others as well. That we are instruments, like we've asked God to be part of that kingdom and part of God's will. We are part of God's work in this place. And we give thanks to God for the power of the Holy Spirit that unites us as God's people. Gives us the ability to do these things and keeps us always centered and surrounded by the love of God. Yes, we are bold to pray because Jesus has given us the gift of our salvation. We are bold to pray because Jesus invites us into prayer, into relationship with himself, with God, and with each other. Yes, there is so much more to explore and to talk about when it comes to prayer. But as we look to ignite our faith, to spark this prayer life in our lives. This is an opportunity to look at these scriptures in the many different way that prayer plays a part. It's a focus this week as we go forward to spend time in prayer. As simple as praying for little decisions and big decisions. Even if we have to schedule it in our calendar so we don't forget to build this habit to ask the Holy Spirit to remind us and empower us to do it. So that we can pray in thanksgiving, asking for the needs of others and for ourselves, and always keeping us focused on Christ's death and resurrection and this gift of prayer given to us to build our relationship with God and each other. Amen.